Hello, young scholars. A quick lecture about our visual and auditory perception, how we see the world and how we hear the world. Uh, as you watch this, it is advised that you pause when you need to, make sure you take good notes, and we will make sure that we have time to talk about this later and you can ask any questions that you may have uh, after viewing this. So the thing that both visual and our auditory perceptions have in common is that in order to experience both of these senses, we need waves, whether that be light waves or sound waves. Uh, we need waves to uh, travel through our environment and register with sensory neurons that we have in our body. So we'll start with our sense of sight. And in order to see, you need light waves. That is the stimulus energy required. And when we're thinking about light waves, there are essentially two different ways to measure this. We can measure light waves through their wavelength, and that is going from the top of one crest to the top of the next crest. And the other way that we measure light waves is by their intensity, or what we call the amplitude. And that is going to go from the top of the crest to what we call the trough. And you can see here what that tells us about the light itself. Uh, the longer the wavelength, that means the lower the frequency. In other words, if you were to time how many wavelengths were to travel per second, Obviously, if the wavelength is longer, you would have fewer uh, light waves per second, so a low frequency, and that is going to be more of our red and orange colors. Whereas a light wave that has a short wavelength, you can see this short wavelength right here, it's traveling much, much faster. There would be more of those light waves happening per second. And so short wavelengths or higher frequency that is going to give us kind of our blues, indigos, and violet colors. Um, you can imagine a rainbow, and if you imagine a rainbow correctly, uh, you can imagine the red being on the top and the violet being on the bottom of a rainbow. If you were to flatten that out, the red would be much longer, so you can think a long wavelength, whereas uh, the blues, indigos, and violets there on the bottom of a rainbow, if you were to flatten that out, it'd be shorter. You can think a shorter wavelength or perhaps some other mnemonic that you can come up with. Uh, as far as the amplitude itself, the greater the amplitude for a light wave, uh, the brighter that color is going to be. And you can see there that if you have a, a small amplitude or, sm or smaller intensity, then it's going to be a little bit duller with the colors. Now one thing you're going to want to be able to do is compare light waves to sound waves. So you can see that with sound waves, we measure the waves the exact same way. We measure them through wavelength and through amplitude. Now, with light waves, wavelengths tells us about different colors. With sound waves, wavelengths are not telling us about color, but it's telling us about pitch, how high-pitched or how low-pitched a sound is. And then amplitude is going to tell us simply how loud a sound uh, may be. And you can see our graph down there. Um, with wavelength, the longer the wavelength, the lower the pitch is going to be. Whereas with a really short wavelength, you're going to have higher pitches. Uh, amplitude, larger amplitude, it's, the sound will simply be louder. So a really common AP question might be something like comparing uh, what type of pitch to what type of color. And so you can say something like short wavelengths, which would lead to higher pitch, uh, would be similar to short wavelengths that would lead to something like blue colors whereas long wavelengths might lead to a lower pitch, and long wavelengths would lead to perhaps a red color. So be able to draw those comparisons between the two. You should have a handout of, of an eye, and you can label that, that diagram of the eye. You can see here the different parts. Um, it, it's not a bad idea to read through this section in your textbook. There's a fair amount of detail. I'm just going to give you a real brief run through uh, with the anatomy of the eye and, and things that we tend to see in, in the AP psychology class. You can see here that as light enters into your eye, the first structure that it's going to run into is the cornea. And the cornea really serves two main purposes. The cornea is going to protect our eye and it is also going to bend light so that it can focus uh, through our pupil. The pupil is the hole in our eye. If you look at somebody's eye, that black circle that you see, that's people's uh, pupil. And a pupil can dilate, which means it gets really big, or it constrict, which means it gets really small. And that happens just depending on how much light is in our environment. 
What allows our pupil to uh, dilate and constrict is our iris. Our iris is a muscle. It is the colorful part of the eye. So if you have brown eyes, hazel eyes, blue eyes, uh, that colored part of your eye is going to be your iris. And what happens is that light will hit your lens. And the lens's job is to focus the light, just like a camera lens would. And the lens is really interesting because the lens can actually change shape through a process called accommodation. And you do need to be familiar with that, that concept. So your lens can use accommodation to uh, focus images from different distances to the back of your eye, which is why you can focus on your piece of paper right in front of you. And you can also focus on the wall across the classroom without having to get up and leave your desk. You can focus on these two different distances without moving because the lens actually changes shape through a process called accommodation. It's going to focus that light on the back uh, kind of lining of your eye, what we call the retina. And it's important that you're familiar with the retina because it's at the retina that transduction takes place. And our next slide is going to be about transduction, so you're going to want to make sure you leave a little room there. But what's contained within the retina are special neurons. And these neurons are sensory neurons. There are two main types. They're called rods and cones. Uh, and they, they work a little differently. Rods are going to be responsible for uh, seeing black and white. Uh, rods help us detect movement. Uh, rods are primarily found in our peripheral vision and rods are uh, not very light sensitive and what I mean by that um, oh sorry rods are, are very light sensitive and what I mean by that is it doesn't take a lot of light uh, for them to work so again rods are, are, are highly light sensitive a very small amount of light can hit your rods and and they will fire uh, those those certain neurons will Cones, on the other hand, allow us to see in color. And cones are not light sensitive. Uh, cones require a lot of light in order to work. And the cones are primarily found in the very back of our eye. Um, you can see here where it says the fovea. The fovea is um, where light is primarily focused, what we some, sometimes call foveal vision. And if you look at a piece of paper, uh, you can focus on one word and if you if you kind of look with your peripheral vision at some words above or below the word you're focused on they'll be a little more blurry and so you can think the image is being projected on your fovea where everything is is the most in focus and then toward the back of your eye you have this blind spot and the idea behind sorry the blind spots right here the idea behind the blind spot is you have an optic nerve and the optic nerve is going to send messages from your eye to your brain. And because you have an optic nerve, what you don't have in that small spot are any rods and cones. Since you don't have any rods and cones there, you can't see. There's actually a, a completely blind spot in each of your eyes. And we'll do a little demonstration to show you uh, how that works when we're together. But be familiar that the blind spot does exist in the back of your eye. And the reason it exists is because there are no rods and cones there. There's no rods and cones because there's a blind spot. I mentioned uh, just a moment ago about the idea of transduction. Now there's a lot of information on this slide here and you can see what's happening is uh, as light enters through your eye, it's going to go to the back retina and it's going to hit either uh, some rods or cones and you can see the difference. You have significantly more rods than you have cones. You have about 120 million rods in your eyes, you have about 20 million cones in your eyes, uh, so significantly fewer. And when light hits uh, those certain neurons, the rods and the cones, then it's going to activate the what we call bipolar cells. And it becomes a, a chemical reaction. And those bipolar cells will send this message to what we call ganglion cells, which then travel down to your optic nerve. Uh, this is what we call transduction. Transduction is the process of taking a physical stimulus, such as light waves, and turning that into an electric message that your brain can interpret. If we shine light on your brain, it wouldn't know what to do with that information. But your brain can take an electric message and, and interpret that as visual code. 
So transduction is the process of converting light waves into an electric message that your brain can understand. And we have transduction with both vision and hearing. And then a couple last notes about our sense of, of sight before we go into our sense of hearing. Uh, we have these neurons in the back of our brain called feature detectors. Uh, they're located in our visual cortex, which again is just the surface of our occipital lobes. And what these feature detectors do is they respond to different angles and shapes in our environment. And so I want you to imagine for a moment that you have this rhesus monkey here and it's looking at different stimuli. It's looking at this rectangle that's kind of angled to the right. It's looking at this rectangle that's straight up and down and then this other angled recton, uh, rectangle. And you'll see that depending on the stimuli, the neurons in the visual cortex respond differently. When it's looking at this stimuli, the neurons going crazy and firing over and over and over again. When we change the angle, the neuron fires less. And then when we change it even more, the neuron is inactive. The neuron is at rest. And so we have millions and millions of feature detectors in our visual cortex, and it helps us detect different angles and shapes in our environment. We have this concept called vision capture. And so we have all of our different senses. We have what we, what we can see and what we can smell and what we can hear, what we can taste. And what's interesting is that our vision tends to take priority over all of our other senses. And so, for example, if you were to take something that is delicious, but it looks really, really gross, if you were to take food coloring, for example, and change the color of food, or you've maybe seen those shows where bakers bake cakes, but they make the cakes look like something that's really disgusting, like dog food or whatever it may be, and people have a hard time eating it. Well, the reason they have a difficult time is because they have a difficult time overriding what it looks like. Our vision tends to dominate all of our other perceptions. Ventriloquist artists take advantage of this. What you see is this wooden dummy talking, and when you hear that voice, the voice is coming from a different source, but it appears as if this, uh, this dummy here is talking to you. And then this last slide about vision deals with two different theories as to how we detect color. And this can be a little complicated. But the idea behind the first theory, what we call the Young-Helmholtz trichromatic theory, is that you have different cones for red, green, and blue. When you see something that's red, you see something that's green, you see something that's blue, these different cones are activated. Um, you can see that there are some flaws with this. Uh, we don't have all of the colors here. And so we also have this theory of what we call opponent processing theory. And with opponent processing theory, uh, it's the idea that we have these, these different channels in which neurons fire. Um, red is going to fire with green, blue is going to fire with yellow, and black is going to fire with white. And the result is uh, numerous different colors that you can see. Um, it can also lead to some really interesting after images. And with both young Helmholtz trichromatic theory and opponent processing theory, um, we will simulate both of these in class. Again, it's relatively complicated uh, just to look at this without doing a simulation. And so put a little star next to those in your notes, and we'll be sure to discuss both of those in class. Moving on to our sense of hearing, uh, here is the anatomy of the ear. Um, sound waves are going to travel through what's called your outer ear, down your ear canal, and hit your eardrum. It's like a tight membrane that stretches across your ear canal. Uh, the eardrum itself will vibrate with sound, and when it vibrates, it will move the bones uh, that are part of your middle ear, what we often refer to as the hammer, anvil, and stirrup. And then the stirrup will push sound deep into this snail-like structure that we call the cochlea. And you do need to know that, the cochlea. A cochlea is where transduction takes place. Just similar to the eye where we have the retina, we have the cochlea, and that is uh, tr going to transition sound waves into electric messages that your brain can interpret. The inside of your cochlea is lined with what's called the basilar membrane. And the basilar membrane has these neurons that protrude from 
uh, the lining and as those neurons wave back and forth with vibrations it sends an electric message to your brain down the auditory nerve that you can interpret the only other thing that you really need to know from this slide you'll see up here you have these three tubes uh, that we call your semicircular canals and they actually don't have anything to do with hearing uh, but they are filled with fluid and they help you uh, with your balance and as that fluid moves around it's sending a message to your brain on how upright uh, your head is and so if you spin around really quickly for example the fluid in your semicircular canals starts moving around quickly and you feel dizzy uh, we had two theories of color vision young helmholtz trichromatic and opponent processing theory uh, we also have two theories in regard to how we detect pitch and so with our first theory it's what we call place theory and the easiest way to remember this is just think uh, what is the place on the cochlea where we have uh, neural activity? And so as sound travels into the base of our cochlea, you can see that there's all these different neurons and different pitch sounds will register in different places of the cochlea. So those really high pitch sounds, if you hear a flute, for example, those high pitch sounds are going to register closer to the base of the cochlea. Whereas really low-pitched uh, low sounds, like a tuba, might register further down in the cochlea. And if you have uh, some hearing loss, for example, you may damage some neurons toward the base of your cochlea. And if you damage neurons toward the base of your cochlea, you may struggle to hear higher-pitched sounds. It's one of the reasons why people who have hearing loss often struggle to hear female voices more than male voices. Uh, because they have neural damage toward the base of their cochlea, but perhaps not the same neural damage toward the end of the cochlea. And then the second theory as to how we understand pitch is what we call the frequency theory. And the idea behind frequency theory is simply that for every sound wave, you have a neuron firing. And so you can see that here we have these long wavelengths, and the neurons are firing that kind of equate with each wavelength. And then as the pitch increases, we have shorter wavelengths, a higher frequency, and the neuron fires more often. Now this is a very simplified version. This you know, looks like two sound waves and four sound waves. Recognize that with actual pitch, we're talking about you know, as much as 2,000 sound waves per second. And so if you have something that's 2,000 sound, wa sound waves per second, that neuron would be firing 2,000 times a second. But there's a problem with the volley principle. The problem with the volley principle is as pitches get higher and higher and higher, neurons can only fire so fast. And so to help with this um, understanding, again, this is frequency theory, is something called the volley principle. With the volley principle, it helps us better understand really high pitch sounds. Neurons can only fire so fast. And so if you have a high-pitched sound, let's say something that's 8,000 hertz or 10,000 hertz or 16,000 hertz, then as, those, as that frequency increases, we will have multiple neurons that are all clustered together that are all firing sequentially to try to essentially equate to the sound waves. So this is a very simplified version, but if you hear a sound, right here you have a sound that's uh, 10 sound waves. Well, this one neuron can't fire 10 times in this amount of time. But if you put these four neurons together, you can see that the total response is 10 neural firings to match that sound wave. And this is our last slide for the day. Uh, just two different types of hearing loss that some people suffer from, what we call conductive hearing loss and then sensory neural hearing loss. Uh, conductive hearing loss tends to happen because of damage to like the eardrum. Uh, for example, if you dive too low in a swimming pool or if you go up too high in an airplane and you have an eardrum rupture, this is conductive hearing loss. Uh, the good thing about conductive hearing loss is that it can usually be corrected. Uh, sensory neural hearing loss, on the other hand, takes place in the inner ear. It takes place within the cochlea where we have actual damage to the neurons themselves. And the problem with sensory neural hearing loss is that there's currently no treatment. Once those neurons in your cochlea are damaged, they aren't coming back. And so although we can have some help and assistance with hearing aids, 
uh, it's not going to actually be repairing those neurons themselves. So that is a lot of information in 20 minutes. Uh, we will go over this in class. If you have questions, uh, don't hesitate to ask me, and good luck.